Hey everybody! In this video we are dealing with the topics of imperialism and colonialism and how they relate with global missions. All right, let's start with some definitions first. I've often found that people use the word colonialism when they actually meet imperialism. So let's kind of break these things down. All right, so imperialism is a policy of extending a country's power and influence through diplomacy or military force. There's also economic imperialism. In fact, that's a lot of what we saw in the 18th or the 19th, early 20th century. All right, whereas colonialism is a policy or practice of acquiring full or partial political control over another country, occupying it with settlers and exploiting it economically. All right, that settler piece is really important. Okay, so like what we saw in the 15th, 16th century in America uh, was absolutely colonialism. A lot of what we're gonna be talking about um, in the 19th century is more imperialism. Okay, uh, this note in the bottom, obviously these terms are intertwined, all right? Um, but the differences I wanna highlight, imperialism is more about the policies of the aggressor nation to extend their power or sphere of influence. Colonization is the process by which an aggressor nation sends settlers and creates colonies in other countries, okay? So keep that in mind as we talk about this. So now we want to talk about old versus new imperialism, all right? Old imperialism refers to European exploration and subsequent exploitation of various peoples in the Americas, Southeast Asia, um, Africa between the 18th and the 19th, the, sorry, the 16th and the 19th centuries, okay? We talked a lot about this without using this terminology, especially when we're discussing the Americas. Um, Europeans also set up trading posts in Africa and China during this era. Now, new imperialism, this is largely what we think of when we were used the word imperialism, and it began in the 1870s. European countries established vast empires in Africa, Asia, uh, and the Middle East. The U.S. established a sphere of influence in the Americas. The Japanese established an empire in Asia as well. Usually the aggressor, aggressor nations rule through indirect rule, <clears throat> okay, puppet governments, things like that. Probably the epitome of this was the vast British Empire. You know, have you ever heard the term, the sun never sets on the British Empire? Well, actually the sun is kind of setting on the British Empire right now. But anyway, uh, continued on the new imperialism topic. In the 19th century, it was clear that countries no longer built empires in the old fashioned way. Think, you know, the Persians or the Romans or the Mongols, all right, who have like a vast continuous land empire, okay? People aren't doing this anymore. Um, but what the European states did was scramble to control other states, all right? Sometimes this domination was a result of warfare, but often it arose out of trade, investment, business activities that enabled imperial powers to profit from subjected societies and influence their affairs without exercising direct political rule. All right. British rule in India. Uh, the British Empire in South Asia and Southeast Asia grew out of the mercantile activities of the East India Tea Company, which had a monopoly on English trade in India. They had built fortified posts on the coastline, and in the 1750s, the company's merchants began campaigns of outright conquest in India, largely to protect commercial interests, okay? So this isn't actually necessarily the government at this point. This is powerful corporations going in and actually like trying to take over vast parts of the country, all right? In 1858, Queen Victoria assigned responsibility for Indian policy to a newly established Office of the Secretary of State for India. A viceroy represented British royal authority in India. Between the East India Tea Company and British forces, the British began to transform India. They cultivated crops like tea, coffee, and opium. Okay, They built railroads and telegraph networks. All right. So it's a combination of private, 
investment companies and the government. All right, so how was religion handled? What's really interesting here is people always kind of think as missionaries as just agents of their government, and that's actually not true. Um, yes, yes, missionaries came in with certain cultural um, kind of superior issues of superiority, things like that. We can't discount that, but missionaries and the government actually weren't necessarily hand in hand. And in some cases, the government took a more hostile stance towards missionaries if they felt that the missionaries were going to harm their economic uh, interests in the country. Um, a good example of this in India is the Baptists, all right? Uh, they didn't actually like the Baptists being there. Uh, so some of the most famous early uh, missionaries like Ann Judson arrived in India they were set or, sent over by the ABC FM, um, but what? But once they got there, they decided they wanted to be Baptist, and so they were actually kicked out of India by the East India Tea Company. Uh, in her case, she ended up in Burma, which is now Myanmar, of course. Um, so it it depended on po government policies whether or not missionaries were welcome or not in a particular area. All right, the next couple slides are just maps. They're not like the world's greatest maps because I took pictures out of some old world history college textbooks, but you get the point. I couldn't find anything great on the internet. So here we go. Um, you can see here how European powers, Japan and the U.S., are starting to have uh, imperialistic policies over here in Asia. Most prominently is, of course, Great Britain. Britain with uh, their vast Indian kind of holding, which of course is incorporates more than just uh, current day India, uh, Pakistan, Myanmar, all that. Okay, let's here. I'll just leave that up for one more second so you can take a look at it and what imperial powers had control over what areas. All right, then let's turn to Africa. Okay, so if you notice the smaller map here, here are the colonial holdings in 1878. If you notice, in Africa is overwhelmingly independent at this point with some coastal um, regions here being controlled by European powers. All right, obviously probably most notably is South Africa under um, British control. All right, now we can look at the bigger map here uh, in 1914. All right, by this point, okay, it's like about 100 and less than 150 years here, the only independent states left in Africa were Liberia, which was independent, though the, the U.S. had some very, very heavy involvement there, okay? And then, of course, Ethiopia. The Italians had tried to take it. They couldn't. Ethiopia stayed independent through this whole time. All right. This brings us to a really, really important question. How and why did Europeans colonize all of these other countries, okay? The how and the why are actually the same industrialization. All right. The reason they could actually take over countries was because of, you know, these superior technologies and like weapons. All right. You have, you know, wars between <clears throat> groups of people where Europeans have, you know, like automatic weapons and <clears throat> indigenous people have more traditional weapons, spears, knives, things like that. Okay. It wasn't a fair fight. Um, and then they have the reason they're going into these countries is to take out the natural resources to continue industrialization. All right. Now, why do we care about imperialism? I'm sure for some of you, you're like, well, this is really, really obvious, but let's dig into it a little bit deeper. First, it fundamentally changed the geopolitical situation globally. The ramifications of these actions are still felt today. Politically, we can trace many revolutions and, re and wars back to all these policies, including, but not limited to, World War I and World War II. Um, though, of course, there are more factors in both of those wars as well, but we cannot discount the issue of imperialism and colonialism in these wars. <clears throat> 
Okay, now more specifically in kind of a religious context, along with imperialism came missionaries. They may not have always agreed with their government's actions, but they took advantage of the situation nonetheless. Okay, so if you think back to when the Americas were first being colonized by Europeans, all right, I talked quite a bit about how Europeans came in with the cross and the sword, okay? These lands were being opened through colonization and religious came in to convert, all right? Something similar is actually happening here. So that was the era of kind of big Catholic missions, all right? All right, now with imperialism, you have predominantly Protestant countries going into these other countries and opening it up for missionaries. And this is when we start getting the huge wave of Protestant global missionaries. Yes, there was some activity before this, specifically like the Moravians were really active in the 1700s in global missions. Okay, but this huge, huge Protestant push for global missions is pretty much coinciding with more of these imperialistic policies. Um, I don't want to blame imperialism for it because Protestant missions was beginning before that, but they're, they're kind of happening simultaneously. And a lot of times mission fields are being opened because of imperialistic policies, okay, that missionaries may or may not have agreed with, but they took advantage of nonetheless. Less. Okay. Um, another issue that we need to deal with was the deep feelings of racial superiority by aggressor nations. All right. Uh, good example. If you ever read Kipling's The White Man's Burden, it gives you a pretty good idea. It's pretty cringy right now. Um, there was this belief that Western Christians had the responsibility to civilize the Christians in the global south. Okay. So this, this is fundamentally where we see the biggest problem is a lot of missionaries weren't necessarily bringing just religion, they are bringing religion and culture, okay? If you remember back in the early church even, you had, I mean, you've had missionaries since, you know, like year 33, okay? Um, missions aren't necessarily the problem, it's how missions are done, okay? And what kind of issues of cultural su superiority people bring in with them. Some missionaries do it better than others. We're gonna so let's look at a brief history of missions. Prior to 1800, global missions was dominated by Catholics. The Jesuits were particularly active and the Jesuits were actually really, really good at um, doing it in a more culturally sensitive way. You know, one of the things they got in real hot water with the Vatican over was like comparing the veneration of saints with like ancestor worship and being like, I we see no problem with ancestor worship, keep doing it. It's just like veneration of saints. Um, and the Catholic church hierarchy was kind of like, no, don't do that. Um, but now actually it's considered pretty standard, fine practice with missionaries to incorporate aspects like that. Okay, so, all right, enough on the Catholics, all right. Um, but prior to 1800, missions is pretty much kind of a Catholic game. All right, then you read about William Carey, who is an important early missionary. He formed the particular Baptist Society for the Propagation of the Gospel Amongst the Heathen. All right, this name got changed for very obvious reasons. Um, he went to Calcutta in 1793 along with uh, a physician. He translated the scriptures into 35 different languages and worked to end the practice of widow burning. Okay, so uh, he didn't necessarily translate all of those well, but he did translate them into 50, 50 or 35 languages. Um, but his actions really inspired people to take up the cause. All right, so by the turn of the 20th century, there were countless missionary federations, mission boards, thing, whatever they're called, it's kind of the same thing. Some were denominationally run, some were run exclusively by women. This was actually really, really common in fact. Because um, a lot of these original mission boards were run by men who didn't allow women to join. So women made their own boards. And so sometimes within a denomination, you would have the men's board and you'd have the women's board and they both had different goals and they were sending different missionaries into different places. It's really, really interesting. Um, an interesting example of this is like the Women's Missionary Board of the Augustana Synod. 
Um, at one point, the Women's Missionary Society actually had a larger budget than the entire Synod did, all right? Um, it created really fascinating issues of like power between the two groups, but anyway, I digress. All right. Um, so missions obviously continue today, um, though often it plays out much different than it did in the era of colonialism and imperialism. Um, you know, kind of people talk a lot about accompaniment now and what different groups can learn from each other. Okay, so but what is really clear here is that the legacy of missions is incredibly, incredibly complicated. All right, um, I would be really hesitant to just say like global missions are good, but I'd also be really, really hesitant is just say like all global missions are bad all right um there's a lot of complexities and a lot of nuance in this topic okay um i have got on for a long time here so i'm gonna wrap it up thank you very much everybody bye